Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here with us today. My name is Ravi Kunanda, and I'm excited to be here hosting today's webinar, Banking as a Service and Embedded Finance to Lead Fintech Innovation. As you can see here, we're going to be first joined by CEO Shamir Karkul for a fireside chat on embedded finance and banking as a service. This will then be followed by a presentation by three companies that are all innovating within this space. But for now, let's go ahead and move on to the keynote for this event. Shamir Karkul is CEO of Sela, a fintech software platform that provides payment infrastructure as a service. He co-founded it in 2018 with the goal of empowering financial innovation and supporting entrepreneurs who want to build a new financial world. In 2009, he co-founded Simple, the first bank of its kind in the United States. In doing so, he actually played a crucial part in building the infrastructure that would pave the way for online banking. After BBVA had acquired Simple, he headed the open platform at BBVA. Shamir studied physics and computer science at Bangalore University and is, the graduate, and is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. So I'm gonna pass it right over to Shamir for the fireside chat. Thank you so much everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Davis and I'm one of the Ventures Associates here in Plug and Play. And today we have a very special guest joining our webinar, Shamir Karkul. A fintech pioneer with more than 10 years of entrepreneurial experience in this space, who also successfully exited his previous startup and who is currently the CEO and founder of Sila. And uh, for those who might not know, Sila is an API platform that provides banking and payments infrastructure as a service and uh, is also one of plug and place portfolio companies. And uh, during this summer, they also raised $13 million Series A round. So, Shamir, thank you so much for taking your time and being uh, on this chat with us. Thank you very much for having me, Davis. Yeah, amazing. And um, first of all, I would like it would be great if you could give us a quick introduction about yourself. You know, you've had a very successful career. You launched the first independent neo bank in the U.S., and um, that also led to an acquisition by BBVA. Um, so I think the audience would love to hear more about the experience at Simple, then also spending time at BBVA and uh, what led to the acquisition, and also learning more about Sila and what led for you to found this company? Totally. Uh, and honestly, Davis, I feel like I could talk for hours about uh, all of that, but I'm going to try and keep it uh, uh, short and sweet. Um, I used to be a software engineer, actually, um, 15, 20 years ago and came to the US, uh, went to business school, and I was working as a consultant at McKinsey. Um, when my friend and classmate from business school sent me an email saying, let's start a retail bank. Um, and this was the summer of 09. And you'll see how crazy I am that I thought that that was a good idea. Um, and it was just the vision of customer first, easy to use, mobile first banking, uh, which would help people manage their money um, rather than, you know, trying to maximize revenue by charging them a lot of fees and selling them a lot of products, which they didn't understand. And, and that vision really kind of like spoke to me. And I was like, wow, this would be so good if it existed. It, it should exist. Let's see how we can do that, right? Um, I ended up uh, leaving McKinsey, moving back to the US and starting up uh, Simple in 2009. Um, and it actually took us three years from that first email to actually launch it. Um, and that's because nobody had ever done it before. And so we had to figure out how to do everything. And we mostly figured it out by doing it wrong first before we did it right. Um, fintech as a word, I don't think was 
really existed. People called it financial services or financial technology. And fintech infrastructure definitely did not exist. So there were no partner banks in the space. There were no processors. And, and we had to kind of get the partner bank model from the prepaid card industry and say, hey, that's what that's the model we want. And that's the uh, some of the technology that we want. But we want a product that's not a prepaid card. We want it to be a core checking account for middle income Americans. And so it needs a lot more features and finally built and launched it after three years. And then barely two years later, it was acquired by BBVA for what seemed like a very uh, good outcome at the time. Uh, now it feels, looking at the industry, we probably missed a couple of zeros, right? Um, but uh, a few months after the acquisition by BBVA, I was in Madrid talking to the exec team, and one of them mentioned this idea of building a platform. And I was like, yes, please do it. The world needs API platforms in banking, but please do it right. Don't screw it up. Um, and it, it was really just an idea that spoke to me of like, hey, if such a thing had existed, Josh and Shamir wouldn't have spent three years launching uh, Simple. We could have launched it in six months and who knows how much we could have changed the world then. Um, uh, quickly realized that it was just an idea. They didn't have any sort of a plan. So I wrote them a document and a year later I was running that business. So I left Simple, moved to BBVA, which was the parent company and built and launched two API platforms for them as internal ventures, one in Europe and one in the US uh, and launched them and even got some customers. Uh, but the I was never really able to scale those platforms. And uh, the real reason was because you could, onboard into the sandbox and, and build an app in a week uh, because it was technology was easy to use, but it would still take you 18 plus months to get through risk, compliance, legal, BBVA strategy, and get to the point where you were allowed into production. <laughs> uh, and, and that works if you're a you know, if you're a large company like Google, who was one of uh, my customers at BBVA, but it doesn't work for a seed or series A startup because they just don't have that much time. <laughs> they raise money for 18 months and they have to hit their next milestone within that period or they go out of business, right? Um, so that was frustrating for me. And I left in 2017, thought about life for a while and decided I still wanted to solve this problem. I just didn't want to do it at a large bank. The problem is that it's just too hard to program with money. If you wake up as a developer anywhere on the planet and you want to program with email or voice over IP or SMS or any internet protocol, it's quick, easy as APIs, SDKs. The hard thing is to compete with like Gmail, but most people who are programming with email are not building superhuman or hey, they're just building some email functionality into an app. It's so easy to do it. It's quicker to do it than to talk about it. The moment you come to the world of money, you realize that suddenly there is no internet protocol for money. So, and, and then there's a lot of people trying to build that in the crypto space. They still have a ways to go. Um, there are no APIs or SDKs, whether you're in San Francisco or Shanghai matters a lot uh, in the world of money. It doesn't matter in the world of email. Uh, and suddenly you have to start working with banks and it takes you 12, 18 months to build anything. Uh, now, if you do build something, you'll realize that it's much easier to compete with Bank of America than it is to compete with Gmail. But really, most people who are programming with money are not building neobanks. Uh, there are I don't know, 50, 100 neobanks in the US now. There's a market for that. But most people who are programming with money are just trying to embed some payments capability into an app or a business. And it's really like, which business needs money? Well, all of them, right? Uh, and, and so it's like, which business app needs money? Actually, all of them. Um, so that when you look at it from that perspective, you realize the market is is, is really massive. Um, and that's the whole thesis behind like embedded payments or embedded fintech is just, just like every app needs embedded email and, and very rapidly every app needs embedded uh, SMS or embedded voice or embedded chat. It, every app is rapidly needing embedded money as well. And 
exactly what type depends on what the app is but everybody needs to onboard their end users everybody needs to verify their identities if you're in a regulated space they need to pull in money hold that money transfer it somewhere and pay somebody else out across a variety of payment systems that's what we do at Scylla a core product is a rest over http api platform that does exactly those things that's pretty amazing. Uh, I love that story, and and I can definitely tell that you know through the experience of being in a startup, then going into a large corporate, definitely can uh, definitely showed you that it's very difficult to work with financial institutions if you're in the very early stage startup. So it definitely makes sense to to start a company like Sila. But we'll talk about Sila in, in a bit. Uh, but before that, I wanted to talk about your time in BBVA. You know. Um, you definitely saw, and you already touched upon a couple of the technological challenges, but in general, what were the, the main challenges that you are seeing right now that banks are facing in terms of you know, technology, business models, even cultural challenges? Uh, would love to hear that. Yeah, so I, I think banks in the modern world, um, especially when it comes to like embedded FinTech payments, uh, anything, uh, there's really three categories of challenges they face. Um, the first is just the technology. So most banks are on a very outdated technology stack. And um, they, they, if you look at most banks' core processing systems, um, it's still a mainframe-based core processing system written in COBOL um, that was state-of-the-art in 1980, but was outdated by like 2000 and is woefully outdated in 2020. Uh, and you run into two problems there, which is if you're using 1980s era technology, you're going to face 1980s era costs. So you look at cost of processing a checking account and you're like, wait, like, email, I can send a million emails for like five cents, right? Uh, what, what, why am I paying $15 for a wire? And you're like, well, that the processing is very different. Uh, and, and so the, those costs are that are built into that outdated technology are very high. But even worse is it's high, it's very inflexible. If you I remember this time at BBVA where we were, we had to make a change in the core. And we actually had a team within the open platform team, we just did that because sometimes it, it required all that way. And it was like, hey, we need to expand this one field from like, I think it was like six characters to 12. That was like a three month project. I'm like, really? It was just that adding six characters? I was like, yeah, it's going to cost us like 200K in three months. I'm like, what? I don't understand this. Relatively cheap, honestly, can compare to the scale of 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 things, right? Um, but that's 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 emblematic. The things that in the modern tech world, you tell an engineer and it's like done by tomorrow, take three, six, twelve months in the world of uh, mainframes. So if you're in that world, flexibility is a massive problem. Cost is a massive problem, um, and serving customers who demand flexibility and low cost becomes next to impossible. The bigger problem than that is actually just compliance. Um, banking is a heavily regulated industry and banks in general are heavily regulated institutions. That, that's fine, but banks don't know how to do compliance as a service. So if you're an innovator who wants to go work with a, a bank, you the early days for a lot of people tend to be like, you know, like they're do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? It's almost like the banks are speaking a different language than the innovators are. And, and it takes a long time to get all the parties to even understand each other. Um, and, and so that whole process itself can take 12, 18 months to say, hey, do you understand our compliance requirements now? Great. Now do you think you can meet them? And the, the, the tech startup is just looking like a deer in headlights through this, right? Um, so compliance as a service is something that banks really don't know how to do. But without those embedded compliance capabilities, embedded fintech just doesn't work, right? Because you can't operate illegally, but then operating legally is massively challenging. Um, but then the final problem that banks face in this space is that they just don't understand developers. Banks are used to working with like individuals through a branch-based interface, businesses through a branch-based, paper-based, 
document focused interface. That's how banks operate. That's how their internal systems are set up. And they do it at massive scale uh, for the large banks. Uh, that's not how developers operate. Like I still remember 10 years, 11 years ago in the early days of Simple, we were talking to, I don't remember who it was, was one of the big three FIS, Fiserv, Jack Henry vendors. And I was like, okay, this all sounds great. You say your uh, core can do all of these things. Can you send me your API docs? And the, the sales rep was like, API? What is an API? And I was like, you're selling a technology product in 2010. You don't even know what the word API means. Uh, but that's 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 the kind of the, the biggest problem is just the cultural difference between how banks think and how the world of developers and developer infrastructure thinks. Banks just don't understand what a great developer experience means. Definitely, I, I can definitely relate. I, in my previous life, before plug and play, I was actually an internal auditor for a large Norwegian bank um, for a couple of years. Our core banking system was from 1993, I believe. And when we were doing IT audits, we had the same problems that you were just mentioning, you know, super high costs and everything like that. Yep, and 93 is actually, at least in the US would be relatively newer. A lot of people are still sitting on tech. I, I remember in one bank data center, within the last 10 years, I saw a PDP 10. And I was just like, Oh, my God, this is like something out of a museum, they stopped making this in 1983. They're still running this hard. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's wild. It's wild. Um, but yeah, you know, like, um, big technology companies, and you know, non non banking players, uh, they cannot build, they can build financial service offerings, but you know, and, and you kind of mentioned that it's very hard to become regulated. So for them, getting a license is almost impossible. So banking as a service is almost the only option that they can go for, you know, and, and we are seeing already several banks kind of going into that space. Of course, BBVA, Goldman Sachs, Standard Charter and others. Um, what are your thoughts in general of banks offering banking as a service? Do you think it's, um, do you think it's the future? Do you think a lot of banks will start offering that? Uh, and also in your opinion, what are kind of the biggest challenges and also at the same time, what are the biggest risks, uh, sorry, biggest opportunities uh, by launching banking as a service? I think a lot more banks are going to get into it. Um, and I think a lot more banks will struggle and fail at it uh, because, it, you know, it's, it's, it's different imperatives, right? Like, um, I think by number of customers now, Chime is one of the top 10 banks in the US, um, at least by, for individuals. It was the fastest growing bank in 2020 in terms of new customer additions. Um, and this is not just Chime, there are so many other neo banks uh, as well. And, um, and, and you look at those trends and if you're a large bank, you're like, okay, maybe I do have whatever, five, 10, 20 million customers. Um, but Chime is getting a lot more. And it might just be that a lot of my customers also have a Chime account, uh, or maybe my average customer age is like 55 and Chimes is 30 or 35. Uh, so I, I might be okay for another year, decade maybe, but it's, you know, you can see the writing on the wall. And so the question is like, how do you deal with it? That's the imperative that the large banks are facing. Um, for the small banks in the community banks, it's, it's kind of even worse. Um, the, the regulation just seems to increase every decade um, and the cost of uh, of managing it, costs just seem to increase. Uh, community banks typically don't control their own technology. They rely on one of the big three vendors um, and, and, and those costs don't go down either. Um, and, and it's like you look at community banking and, and you've got to question if, if there is a viable model for any banks like sub 500 million in assets, uh, maybe even sub billion in assets. And so you see a lot of small banks being like, hey, there, there really is no future in community banking. We need to get into the new world. And they, you know, then they, they build platforms and, and try to become sponsored banks. Actually, all the sponsored banks in the fintech space are the ones are all small banks, right? Like I think the only one that's big is like, uh, Wells Fargo does some, and then uh, Goldman Sachs does some, right? Uh, but again, if you look at Wells Fargo, their big customer is PayPal, Goldman Sachs, it's Apple. And it's like, well, those are not small companies. They're not 
serving Series A startups, right? Uh, the ones who are serving Series A startups are the the Suttons, the Lincolns, the Evolves, uh, the Bancorp banks. So those are all smaller banks. Um, so it's it's different imperatives, but a lot of banks, both big and small, are, are getting into this. But they face the same kind of issues. Uh, one is the small banks don't control their technology. So then it's really hard to persuade FISA or FIS to kind of really help you support uh, the, the next wave of customers because you know they're, they're, they're just going to charge you an arm and a leg where do you find the money. Uh, the large banks frequently do control their own technology, but then that technology is like 30 years old. So how do you get from here to there? <laughs> so it doesn't, there's different challenges, but it doesn't go away. The tech is still a problem. Uh, the compliance is, is still a problem. Uh, and, and it challenges again differ between large and small banks. The small banks sometimes don't even know what they're doing. And the large banks sometimes know too much about what they're doing and just see risk everywhere and can never get out of their own way to actually do something. Um, and then the, you know, the, the dies in committee, <laughs> the death of a thousand cuts. Uh, but then you look at it and across the whole space, bankers just don't understand developers. And that tends to be the universal problem of like, yeah, I'm, I've got this capability. I can, I can offer it to developers. I'm like, do you have an API doc? Do you know anything about building an API platform? If you don't understand what that involves, what makes you think you're going to be able to do this? Um, not that it's not doable. I think it is doable. I think it is an imperative and it will, it's happening and it will happen. I just, you look at like 4,800 banks in the US and even two decades from now, I don't think there's going to be 4,800 bank API platforms maybe 50, <laughs> uh, maybe, right? Uh, maybe five, it's, it's, it is a tech, much more of a technology business, has economies of scale, it will consolidate. And uh, I, I, it, it won't end up with like one, uh, but it won't end up with 200 either. So, so a lot of people will try to get into it. A lot of people will fail is my expectation. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I don't think, I think a lot of, comp a lot of banks will try it, uh, they'll fail, uh, and there'll be a couple of winners. There won't, yeah. there will not be one winner. There'll be a select group. Few. Who I'll, I, there'll be a few, either early adapters or the ones who will make it the most user friendly from developers' point of view, as you mentioned. And, and also, one of the banks. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say for a, for any bank getting into this, I would take the strategy of trying to truly understand what you, as a bank, traditional bank, are really very good at. Are you really very good at like? small business lending or, or commercial real estate or, or mortgages or whatever, and try to focus on building a platform in those areas. And because the, the trying to build sort of a general purpose, the AWS of money, um, I would recommend leaving that to guys like the Stripes and the Silas of the world. Uh, they, it, it, is, it is not easy to do. Um, but if you say, hey, we, we are a big, uh, you know, whatever, small business lender on the West Coast. We're going to build out a platform for to do more small business lending on the West Coast. Probably have a lot of insights and knowledge and capabilities, which gives you a leg up. You still have all the same problems, but you have some advantages now, which you can bring to the table. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, actually, one of the banks you mentioned was Evolve. And... Uh, I actually recently learned that you're one of on their uh, open banking advisory board. Uh, so what is the relationship between Sila and Evolve? And uh, can you tell, tell more about that? Uh, Evolve is our partner bank and, uh, you know, all of Sila's customer funds are in FBO accounts at Evolve. All the payments are, uh, are processed through Evolve. Um, and I have a very good relationship uh, with the team at Evolve, and I would say we have a very good relationship is you know, multiple layers within the company. And we, there's probably somebody at Scylla talking to somebody at Evolve on a pretty much a daily basis, right? Um, and uh, we've been partnering them, with them for three years now. Um, they are one of the most innovative and forward-thinking banks in this space. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is when you look at like uh, the top team there, people like Scott Lenar, Scott Stafford, Hank Ward, and, and the team around them, uh, most of them not, not, didn't really start their career as bankers, right? Um, Scott was a, Scott Lenar was a programmer back in like the 
I don't know, like the early 90s, I think, or late 80s, and then got into um, uh, broker dealer stuff, and then eventually acquired Evolve, um, I think, just before the financial crisis in like uh, 2007, 2008. And it was a small bank, and they built out this thesis of making it more of a mortgage bank and, and doing a lot more mortgage processing. Um, and, and that worked for them. Um, and then eventually they expanded into the you know the the sponsored banking business uh, and started working with customers. Um, initially, I think it was folks like uh, Synapse and uh, and their customers, but now they partner with us, of course, with Synapse, but with even with much larger companies like Stripe. Um, and uh, and and I think part of that problem of like bankers not understanding developers is not really true at Evolve. Um, and, you know, it's just because they the, the top team definitely does. They still struggle with the technology issues. They still struggle with the uh, the compliance issues. Those those don't go away. But uh, just because of the kind of the DNA that they have, I think they've had a leg up on a lot of other uh, banks trying to get into this space. Um, I've known that uh, the team there for many years now we've been partnered for many years um, and they asked me to be on their advisory board as they navigate this space um, and and they they do have a lot of capabilities but they have a lot of customers the main issue that they struggle with is like how to make this all better and how to scale it right so they have well, now several customers who are giant companies, which give them a ton of volume, which creates a huge amount of pressure. And then they also have to uh, manage that. They have to monitor that. They have you know, regulatory requirements around that. And if they deployed people to do all of those things, they'd like to hire like thousands of people. Uh, so then they try to do it for technology, which is the smart way to do it. Then they have to build out that tech. Um, and that's not trivial to do. Um, so Evolve in many ways is on the cutting edge of the bank uh, sponsorship space. Uh, they talk a lot to their regulators um, and they have to educate their regulators as well and take them along on this journey. Because if you think, Bankers struggle to understand. Oh, regulators really struggle. Um, so you know, but but they are key stakeholders as well. So on all of these things is what we work with them on. Gotcha. That, that makes a lot of sense. And um, you know, we're we're uh, kind of approaching the the end part of our conversation. So I wanted to definitely get, leave some time to talk about Sila. Of course, you know, um, we have. Not only you know representatives from financial inst institutions on the line, we also have entrepreneurs, fintech uh, founders, and and industry specialists on the line. So, could you share some specific case studies? You know that uh, which companies have benefited from Sila? You know, and what are the benefits you can provide to other companies uh, today? Totally, um, we have over fifty apps live in production now. Um, so let me pick a couple of examples. Um, one of my favorites is a company called Fabrica. Um, uh, Fabrica.land is their website. You can go check it out. Um, and they they do NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens in the crypto space, but they do NFTs for land. Um, so you can go to the uh, Fabrica website, sign up. Um, it's a you know it's pretty much like any other fintech or crypto app sign up they'll verify your identity and then uh you can go in and say hey i want to buy you know whatever two acres of land in uh arizona or nevada for relatively small amounts of money 10 20 000, maybe even just like five thousand sometimes um and it's like how do you buy this land the way they do it is they um they create a special purpose trust. They transfer the ownership of the land into the trust and on the county registrar's office and all of that. And then they issue an NFT and the holder of the NFT is the beneficiary of the trust. And by doing this, they have legally kind of encapsulated the ownership into the NFT. I'm, I'm butchering all of this. You should really <laughs> go check them out directly. Uh, but the end result is you can go buy a piece of land from them and it'll take like, you know, whatever half an hour to do all the paperwork and everything and you can then trade it like 10 times a day um and and there's a large market for land speculation in the us um and they are you know 
making inroads into that and making that whole land speculation space massively easier through NFTs. Uh, and eventually they want to manage all of, you know, title and, and real estate. Like if, if you've ever bought or sold a house in the US, you know what a pain in the ass the process is, right? Like you actually have to really usually do it in physical with paper and with wires and checks. And you're always worried that something will break, right? They make that all seamless online um, and, and very, very clean. And they use us on the back end for the KYC, for the payments. They use our stable coin on Ethereum. Um, and and it's, it's really cool if you go and look at how it all works on the back end. But you don't need to. You can just go buy land through them and it'll all work. <laughs> so that's, you know, that, that's, that's a cool customer, one of our early customers, and they're doing well. And I'm, I'm very happy for them. Um, uh, maybe another one um, is um, a company called uh, Bunny Money. Uh, they are, they've been talking to us for a while as well, uh, but recently got launched and started scaling um, and they do charitable donations. So they will help you save money as an individual and then automatically donate that to a series of charitable organizations that they work with. Um, and uh, from the charitable organization perspective, they cut the costs of processing payments to zero. They actually charge no fees at all, and they have a, a model which is much more SaaS-like. Um, and it's it's the whole model is in early days, but it is quite transformative. Because if you think businesses struggle, for-profit businesses struggle with payments, charities struggle with payments even more, right? Uh, and so they're making that process vastly easier and simpler for the charities and also for the donors. Uh, and there's like dozens of others like that i could i could go on for a while uh we do tend to serve smaller companies earlier stage companies that's that's always been near and dear to my heart is you know the the josh and shamir of 2009 trying to launch a bank from their basement in brooklyn uh but we have some some larger customers as well now one public company as well um and uh, it's the same cap capabilities uh it's just that you know we need a lot more sophistication and the large customers take a while uh, to come on board. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Super happy and I'm glad to hear you're, you're, you're doing great. And, and uh, I'll definitely look into that uh, Fabrica land. Uh, I think NFTs uh, will have a lot of applications in the future and, and super cool that CLA is powering them. But Shamir, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, uh, on this call today. And uh, you know, for anyone who is interested, uh, where they can find more information about CELA and uh, how, can, how can they get, get in touch with you guys? Well, the best uh, place to start is always our website, which is www.silamoney.com, S-I-L-A-M-O-N-E-Y.com. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, I'm very active. We are also very active on Twitter, um, Shamir underscore K or uh, at the rate Silla Money. And then um, uh, obviously LinkedIn as well. Uh, and then you can always just email me. I'm Shamir at Silamoney.com. Amazing. Again, thank you so much, much for uh, joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me, Davis. Thank you both, Shamir and Davis, for that incredibly informative conversation. You can, you can really tell just how passionate they both are about the topic. And thanks, Shamir, for taking the time to share your expertise with us today. So before we can move on to the startup presentations, I just want to do a actually quick rundown of housekeeping. Um, the rest of our team is actually going to be available for you in the chat box at any time. So if you need anything, just throw a question into that Zoom chat window, and I'm sure someone would be able to uh, be able to assist you. In addition to the chat window, uh, we will also have a ask a question feature in Zoom. After each startup presentation, there will be a brief Q&A. So I recommend asking questions for the startups there. And lastly, don't forget to answer the poll after each presentation to request a meeting with the startups. So if you hear a startup and you wanna meet them and learn a little bit more, uh, you can actually just answer yes in, in that poll and I'll be able to follow up after the event. So let's go ahead and just jump right into the startup presentations. Our first company presenting is an embedded social finance software that helps institutions leverage the power of word of mouth, peer networks, online communities and affinity groups to turn one customer into a community of customers. Let's hear more from Fanta and the Wealthy team. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? So my name is Fanta Gilliam and I am the CEO and founder of Wealthy. 
Wealthy is an embedded social finance software that I developed while working as an American diplomat in East Asia, all over Sub-Saharan Africa. A part of my job prior to, to launching Wealthy was really working with foreign banks and governments to stand up innovative financing facilities. And at that time, I got to experience firsthand how a lot of people in emerging markets were pooling resources and rotating them as a way to save, build wealth, even immigrate to the United States. I got fascinated by it because these groups had a less than 1% default rate and there were 2 billion people worldwide using them outside the bank. And so here you can see me on Air Force Two and me with Dr. who is now First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden during this time. I showed these pictures because they are really the impetus and the inspiration behind our technology. Wealthy is an embedded social finance software really inspired by these informal social banking traditions. And we have had a lot of traction that I'm really excited about. We've developed a pool, a tool that banks can actually license, white label and integrate them into their core and use as a way to offer social banking features to their new and existing customers through strategic partnerships like Discover, MasterCard, and the Independent Community Bankers of America. Now, how are we getting such great traction with banks? We're really focused on a common pain point that a lot of financial institutions are facing right now, which is how can you stay competitive in a world where Robinhood and Reddit, even Apple are investing in financial services to compete with traditional banks and credit unions. Bank branches have been shuttering left and right and customer acquisition costs are on the rise. Wealthy provides a way for traditional financial institutions to really disrupt the disruptors. Think of us as a virtual branch manager. Through Wealthy, a user can activate a savings wallet and it save or invest with family and friends, people that they know and trust as a group. Similar to a LinkedIn or a Facebook, Wealthy offers all of these social networking perks and nudges that you would expect to see. We support influencers and give a bank a pathway to offer that. And then every app Wealthy wallet is powered by either Discover or MasterCard offering. Our technology is really designed to help financial institutions turn one customer into a community of customers. And we do that for offering a suite of white label, customizable social banking apps, affinity cards, and APIs. Our business model is B2B to C, and we sell directly to banks and credit unions. We charge an initial software as a service fee, commission, and signature volume on the card transactions. And we're servicing a $20 billion market in the United States, really honing in on banks' annual marketing and sales spend. And we see our early adopters as the community banks and credit unions that are looking for a way to have a competitive edge in a very fragmented a market where social finance is becoming more and more prevalent. We have an incredible team as well that has worked for organizations such as myself at the US State Department and White House, uh, Deloitte, the World Bank, Better, Harvard, Harvard Law School, and even Wells Fargo. And then lastly, we're looking for strategic partnerships, um, seed capital and commercial opportunities with banks and credit unions, affinity groups and organizations that wanna work with us to, take, to really introduce this concept of social banking and scale it nationwide. And so if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to reach out to me. My name is Fonta Gilliam, and you can reach me at Fonta at WealthyApp.com. Thank you. Right. If, there, if you have any questions for Fonta, um, please feel free to throw them up in the chat box or throw them into our Q&A section, and we'll... Uh, be happy to answer them here. There's some questions in the chat. Uh, can you elaborate on your white label products? Sure, sure. So our wealthy enterprise solution really allows any financial inst institution to offer a social banking experience through their existing bank app. Um, mobile um, debit or credit card offering. And so the way that it works is we have a software development kit that you can actually customize and integrate into a bank core and use as a way to attract and retain customers. Um, and our social networking features, um, the way that we allow banks to tap into the power of word of mouth um, and peer networks really are designed to help banks attract and retain customers at a fraction of the cost that they normally pay. 
Another one from the chat. How is Wealthy helping traditional financial institutions disrupt the disruptors? That is a great question. You know, we firmly believe that uh, community banks, credit unions are really back the backbone of the U.S. economy, and they've been doing that for generations. Unfortunately, they don't have a lot of tools that can help them to tap into the power of social finance that has become so popular amongst millennial and Gen Z communities. And a lot of these millennials and Gen Z have no idea about the incredible products and services offered by community banks and credit unions. And so Wealthy gives them a way to do that um, that is safe, secure, and compliant, and really complements the great work that they're already doing and provide a competitive way to stay relevant in today's market. Well, I think uh, if there's any other questions or if you want to connect, you can please feel free to kind of reach out here or make sure that you have uh, answered yes on the poll that should be on your screen. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the opportunity. Have a great day. All right, next up is ASA. ASA is a scalable platform that removes all barriers to entry, allowing unlimited partnerships between fintechs and financial institutions. ASA aligns incentives between financial institutions and fintechs, allowing them to share data both ways and to market and promote each other's products and services. It's here to, uh, Landon and Ryan are here with us today. Awesome, thank you, Ravi, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, Asa Whitney was the visionary proponent of the Transcontinental Railroad, and that rail line created opportunity for almost a, in, embed, embedding businesses along the uh, rail for startups, uh, industry, opportunity, and the Industrial Revolution led to one of the greatest increases in quality of life in human history. Now, traditional embedded finance or banking as a service is where the fintech uses your bank's products to get new customers for themselves. ASA is flipping that entire model on its head. We're allowing you to embed fintechs to get new customers for yourself. So are you looking to target certain industries, maybe shipping or agriculture or farming or uh, maybe uh, you want to get working with uh, commercial fishing or something like that. Imagine being able to build technology that those customers will use. And then when the customer signs up, they have to come to your bank and become a customer to be able to use those products and services. So we're allowing our partners, our, our bank and credit union partners to be able to own and control the relationship. And what we're doing is really what Apple did for the cell phone. Right now, banking is like BlackBerry. You typically have one app that everyone has to use, whether they want to use it or not. If they want other technology, they have to go to your competitors and they have to leave. Asa is building a model like what Steve Jobs did with the Apple App Store, where within 12 months of leveraging the crowd, they had 12 thousand developers, 75,000 apps and a billion downloads. And Apple became the first billion or trillion dollar company. And now your cell phone can do anything that you can imagine. And that's what we're building for banking, a world where anyone can build really cool tech and use it with you, the bank they love. They can have the best bank with the relationship they have locally. And they can also have that combined with any technology with new stuff coming out. So in essence, ASA is doing what Apple did for banking. And we're going to share some use cases. I'm going to have Ryan Ruff, our head of fintech, go in here. And this is just a few things we've already launched. And keep in mind, you can send any fintechs or tech providers you want to ASA, and we can get them quickly turned on for you. Uh, we have partnerships with venture groups that can build new tech as well. So Ryan, why don't you talk about some of the fintechs that are on? Yeah, great. Thanks, Landon. We've been blown away by how excited many of the fintechs are to work together with financial institutions and grow together. So this is just a few of the ways that our fintechs are planning on helping ace of financial institutions to grow. So Coins, an award-winning app similar to Acorns, but they help you round up your spare change and pay off debt and instead of investing. And Coins is able to use their unique customer data to help you find more loan refinance opportunities that you're currently missing. Another great one, you may have seen EvoShare on the main stage at Money 2020 this year. EvoShare's worked out deals with hundreds of thousands of businesses worldwide to get customers up to 30% cash back when they use your credit card to pay. So what's really exciting about EvoShare is because the cash back the customer's getting it's not coming out of interchange. So this is not going to affect your profits on your cards 
but it can make your credit offerings more exciting than other cashback cards out there. Um, another great one is SpendPal, built in collaboration with Duke University's Behavioral Science Research Lab under world famous Dr. Dan Ariely. So SpendPal nudges people into naturally spending smarter without having to stick to a budget. And one of the things SpendPal does is they actually go right into the footprint of your institutions. They offer their free app there. And then if people want to upgrade to the premium experience, they have to switch to your institution. So they really drive new account and new customers. Uh, another great one is uh, Local Light. I don't know um, if that one's up on there, Landon. Or, or Namu. Yeah, Namu's great. So Namu actually uh, works with your 1099 account holders. So Namu will go in and automatically pull their taxes money so that they feel more like a W-2 employee and set that money in a separate savings account for you. So what's great about that is that customer is uh, going to be retained better because they now have two trade lines with you and they're going to have an average daily balance that's higher. Uh, last one I'll share here is Local Light. These guys are awesome. They connect with local chambers of commerce and get people to start going, uh, spending their money locally. And they help to drive new account holders and make existing account holders stickier. So this is just some of the ways that some of these fintechs are trying to help uh, financial institutions and grow together. Thanks, I actually Ryan. got a question, question here in the chat and just wanted uh, from an attendee saying, they wanna know how long it would take to get started. How long would it take to go live with ASA? Yeah, so we are now live on Jack Henry and uh, we are working on some other core processors. So if we're not in the core processor yet, it's gonna take probably about three months to get fully integrated and to be able to unlock any fintechs that you want to work with. And then sending new fintechs over, we can typically turn those on in as little as uh, two weeks. And then uh, one more one more question in here. Um, uh, Teddy says, it's a heavy lift to get one or two integrations going for the average bank. Apple has millions of apps. How are you going to give a bank instant access to new apps and embedded tech without security and compliance risks? Yeah, you know, we've we've built something here that solves that security and compliance risk. And the big difference is that the fintechs aren't selling regulated products and services. They don't have a debit card with their logo on it. They're not quoting rates um, because they're not selling regulated products or services. They're leaning on the partner bank for all of that. And so we've eliminated a huge piece of the security and compliance burden. And then also regulated data. Um, we're never sharing regulated or PII data with fintechs. We have a platform that anonymizes and tokenizes all of the account numbers, making this um, a very safe way to use fintech, the safest that's ever been built. And so that allows the uh, banks to quickly bring on new tech solutions and to have unlimited apps, just like what we see with Apple and kind of unlock innovation in a way that hasn't been possible before because of the, the bottlenecks, you know, with, with traditional banking as a service, there's liability if the fintech does something bad, uh, the charter of the sponsor is at risk. Thank you so much. I think this is all the time that we've got for now, but um, if anyone out in the crowd wants to meet up with Asa uh, following this uh, webinar, please feel free to answer the poll or uh, shoot me an email directly. Thank you. And our last company that we'll be presenting today is Lenflow. Uh, Lenflow is building an embedded, embedded credit service that has never been this easy. Lenflow provides the infrastructure for software companies to launch innovative business credit products. So let's hear it from the Lenflow team. Hi, I'm John Fry, founder and CEO of Lendflow. We provide infrastructure for embedded lending services. Uh, embedded finance is here to stay. We've seen a lot of growth over the last couple of years, a lot of new innovative products being released. And I think the, of, in, the trend of embedding these lending and credit services, financial services into products, into software um, is, is just beginning. Uh, I think so this will continue to accelerate and you're seeing all types of different products um, being embedded from payroll and payments infrastructure to insurance, you know, banking, card issuing, commercial loans, consumer loans. I think you'll see this trend continue. Um, 
and you'll continue to see a lot of innovation here. I mean, the only thing that's really stopping this from accelerate, accelerating the pace is just the complexity with executing on an embedded lending service. Um, you know, the challenges. You know, there's a lot of hidden complexity, a lot of hidden challenges. It's very capital intensive. It takes like building out a team. It takes the right expertise. Um, and it's very time consuming. It takes a, a while to get to market. Now, many of these services that you see today took two, three plus years um, to, to launch. And so these have been the, the things historically that have slowed down innovation. And you're seeing all this new infrastructure being built to solve for these things. And when that's done, um, you're really going to see this innovation um, increase even more. So what makes embedded lending so effective? Why is this the trend today? Well, first, you know, you're gaining the distribution, right? Instead of going out and, and acquiring these consumers or SMBs individually, you can go out there and acquire a platform where they're engaged with already every single day. So not to, only do you get them distribution on day one, but you get their eyeballs and you get their engagement on a day-to-day a -day basis. Um, you know, also you're dealing, you're able to reach a lot of borrowers that are underserviced. You know, they're underserviced. Historically, they've been lag, lagging behind from a tech perspective. Many of them are starting to catch up there, uh, now and they're, they're behind, um, they're lagging from a financial services perspective. And um, you know, there's also cash flow gaps in the way that these businesses operate. You know, they have to win the projects and construction, for example, they have to pay for the materials and supplies, pay their payroll, pay their people, and then they have to build the thing. And then they have to go in, out there and collect that money and usually on net terms. And so these cash flow gaps um, are another reason. It's so effective you can access these customers when they're experiencing this exact pain point within the software that you're using. And also you're able to find businesses from the same industry. Um, you're able to go deep vertically rather than targeting one financial product or service horizontally across many different services. You're able to access and solve problems for a specific industry, a specific vertical, and go very, very deep there. And I think there's a lot of room for innovation moving from some of these catch-all cookie cutter type products into very industry specific, um, vertically focused financial products and services. Um, what's the value in embedded lending? Uh, I think the first thing people think of is, is opening up a new revenue line. And while that's right, um, and there's a lot more to it that leads into that. And, you know, we've seen the customers that have been most successful usually start with providing the best experience to their customers, to their users, um, and then growing from there. And so, um, and usually that means that drives right, right into the revenue. Um, and so, you know, we've seen customers use it to open up new customer acquisition channels, use it a hook to get new customers on board. We've seen, um, we've seen increasing LTV. So now we can profitably acquire customers from channels that weren't profitable before. Um, you know, we've seen it solves pain points or points of friction on platforms where users get stuck um, because of a financial product or service. Um, is not there. Either paying or get pay or getting getting paid. Um, points of friction around those processes, and also driving the uh, adoption of products and features. Um, you know, allowing customers to purchase inventory or supplies, um, or running payroll, financing products attached to those could increase adoption and the usage of those. And are a nice carrot to get those um, those features used, and which are revenue drivers as well. Um, so, and all of those improve the customer experience and in effect are going to improve, you know, engagement, retention, um, lifetime value of these customers. So what are, are, is the lending infrastructure that LendFlow is providing um, specifically? So it's everything that you really need to issue lending and credit services. So the first, the front end component is a portal to view everything, that loan origination system, that loan operating system, to have everything in one place. Um, you know, it's the components to easily allow you to embed these services um, without any engineering resources. So embeddable applications that you can customize and build, um, you know, creating your own custom workflows for a specific process. It's the aggregation of all the data and APIs that are required uh, for lending and credit services. It's the orchestration or like pulling efficiently and automating the pulling of these APIs and then automating decisioning of this data once you have it 
And then of course, back testing and refining this model and optimizing over time. Um, and so these are a lot of the key components on the Linflow platform. You can have everything in one place, uh, makes it super easy to get up and running to get started. Um, and it reduces this friction. You know, the easier people can launch these, the easier they can get customer data and feedback, and they can build and iterate from that rather than just making assumptions, launching with the product. Um, it's a lot slower, more costly way to do it. We're gonna help to get, get them to market quickly, um, identify the products and services that are gonna be most valuable to the customers, taking customer feedback, and then improve and iterate on that over time. In addition to like making use and understanding and making use of the data that's already in their platform that isn't being leveraged for financial services. There's a wealth of data that's being locked inside this, these platforms that could be leveraged um, that hasn't been to date. And so we want to make it easy for not only using third-party data sources, but using the own your own data that you already have um, to create new financial products and services. Uh, a few examples of customers that we work with today, we're pretty heavy into, again, a lot of those blue-collar based industries construction, home services, uh, transportation, um, equipment share in the construction space, A to B in the transportation space, LMN in the, the home servicing um, with the landscaping software. They have a few of great examples of um, embedded lending services we're working today. Again, my name is John Fry, I'm the, the CEO and, and founder of Linflow. Um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or I might uh, email john at linflow.com. Love to hear for you, from you, love to game plan and strategize, learn how you're thinking about embedded lending and credit services, embedded financial services, and um, um, would love to, to talk. So looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks everyone for the time today. Have a good one, bye. Great. So uh, we do have a few questions that have been thrown out during the presentation. So the first being, how difficult is it to integrate with an embedded lending platform like Lenflow and what does that integration look like? Yep. Hey, everyone. I'm uh, Max. I'm a product manager here at Lenflow. Uh, Going to be back with the uh, PNP uh, on a webinar here. So yeah, in terms of the integration, uh, it's actually very simple. We have a lot of modular components that allow you to integrate the pieces that you need, whether that's an application system for people to be able to apply for loans or the data services you need to in order to underwrite those customers, or finally, just the loan processing system to be able to uh, create offers and uh, ultimately manage the whole process of providing loans to your customers. So uh, it varies, you know, with the size and complexity of the program, but it could be from a few days to a few weeks, typically. Who's using Lenflow today? Um, can you name some of the organizations and are they primarily startups or do you have uh, financial institutions that, you, that are looking into your solution? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So we started primarily with... Uh, um, smaller startups and these types of companies that are trying to launch um, capital programs for their customers. But we've scaled up over time. We have some really large customers now, for example, Equipment Share, LMN. And we're also in conversations with uh, banks and financial institutions who would like to use, for example, our data services in order to make their underwriting more efficient or would like to launch new capital products on top of us without having to spend the two or three years it could take to build that out on their own. Well, if you'd like to uh, connect with Lenflow and you didn't have a chance to during the poll that was on your screen, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly or uh, just say something in the chat as well. But thank you, Maxim, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, who uh, took the time to present their startup today with us. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. For sure. Feel free to reach out anytime. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we wrap up today's startup presentation. So really hope that you enjoyed learning more about the technologies shaping the future of the financial industry. On behalf of myself and the FinTech team, thank you for joining us today. And as uh, at any time, you can always reach me uh, via LinkedIn or via the email that you see on your screen. So thank you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful rest of your year.